And hello, good people of the internet. It is I, Tommy Kelly. This is Adventures in Woo Woo. And this is the monthly, well, I say monthly, but it's been a while since we did this, but it will now, going forward, be monthly question and answers vlog, where people over on Patreon and Discord send me in some questions and I answer them to the best of my ability, given my current understanding, with the kind of idea that in the future I might change my mind about it and everyone has to be okay with that. Because you know, growth is good, all of those things. There's a lot of questions, so we may have to split these into two videos, but we may not, we'll see how we get on. First question. J. Eric, what was the inspiration for the 40 Servants? I feel like you've probably been asked this before, but it was the first question that came to mind. I have answered this before, so I'll probably try and answer it in a different way. My usual answer is kind of to set the landscape of where I was kind of um, mentally, emotionally, financially, and why I ended up doing the Fort Servants because of the situation I was in. But I'll answer it more from, I suppose, from a, a direct influence, like magical influences. At the time, I was using the runes a lot, and I had done a lot with the runes, and I'd been spending a lot of time with the runes. And one of the things that I really liked about the runes is this kind of double feature of the divination element and the magic element. Now, of course, it's probably very likely <laughs> that the runes were used for neither divination or magic. We don't really know, but kind of current new age, thought on it, or maybe that's uncharitable, but current kind of contemporary thought on it, or usage of it anyway, is that it's used for both ma magic and uh, divination. So I really like that. I thought that was something very cool that you had these kind of double uses to something. I also had been in BOTA a couple of years earlier, and BOTA is the Builders of the Adidam, which is a group that was created by Paul Foster Case coming out of the Golden Dawn, where he got a bit scared about all the Enochian stuff, and so he kind of removed all the magic to a certain extent out of the Golden Dawn teachings and, and just kind of focused on tarot and the Kabbalah. And there's some great teachings, there's some dodgy homophobic stuff later on that may or may not have been added by Anne Davies later. When it comes to the tarot stuff, it's pretty, pretty good. It's probably the best that you're going to come from that Golden Dawn kind of approach to the tarot. And in their kind of look at the Major Arcana, they had obviously a divination aspect, but they were more, well, I'm not even sure if they did have a divination aspect, they were more approaching it as a meditative, archetypical, symbolic, almost personality that each of the Major Arcana had from like the Emperor, the Empress, the High Priestess, the Hierophant, etc. So it was more than just a kind of a card, a card that represented good luck or the Wheel of Fortune or sovereignty, or whatever. It was also had all this underlying extraness to it. And I really liked that as well. So it was kind of when I was putting it together, the 40 Servants, both of them were playing in my mind. But it was also what I wanted to do was take all of the different kind of aspects that I'd been learning about and liked and all my preferences from my studies in chaos magic and different spiritual uh, outlooks and different religions and different kind of paths and bring all the bits I liked or that resonated with me and put them in a kind of an aesthetic or a form that I would find easy and pleasing to use, that it was something that I would like working with rather than say using someone else's imagery or that's close to what you like but it's still someone else's and use a kind of a system that I would find useful. Solely thinking just about me and not about other people because it essentially was just going to be a tool that I was going to use and if anyone else was into it, so be it. But the focus was on a very selfish magical act and creating it that it was just for me. So yeah, that's the kind of the main kind of influences from a magic perspective. Andrew, any chance of doing another book club? I really enjoyed the previous book clubs and even purchased several books based on them. Well, the problem with the book clubs is that by the end of it, it's usually just me and maybe one or two other people who have survived towards the end. And it can get very disheartening when everyone falls out by the end of it, you know, and you just kind of feel, well, what was the point of that? And I understand it's easy to have enthusiasm about things at the beginning. And then as, you know, life gets in the way and stuff like that, that you just kind of fall out. And we see this a lot with the group rituals as well that we do on the Adventures in Woo Discord, where it'll start off when everyone's kind of into it. And then some people will pop in and out. But by the end, there's only a handful of people doing it compared to... <laughs> the multitude that it was at the beginning. And that's human nature, that's the way it is. Life gets in the way, and so what if you lose interest? But from a kind of a, a place where there's so much that I want to do and so many things that I want to finish and complete and get into, and I kind of have to say, well, you know, I can't give my energy to all these things. And if this is the thing that fizzles out quite often and has fizzled out at every time I've done it, then it, maybe it isn't something that I can, I'm able to devote my energy to. That all said, I did really enjoy them. Um, apart from the Peter Kingsley one that uh, we did, where I got a very stern letter from Mr. Kingsley, or email, uh, telling me not to do that and to take it down, and that uh, his copyrighted material was not, mo not meant to be used in such a way. And also then an email giving out that I didn't put in URLs to his website, I haven't mentioned him in a video. Very strange, very 
very old style, very, I don't know, Procrustean of some reason, but very in line with Peter Kingsley and his, uh, his attitude. So that kind of put a mar on it as well. But uh, yeah, if I could find a book that I think people might be interested in, maybe not one that isn't too long, let's like say, let's not do the Bible, possibly a TV show or a comic might be better. But yeah, if you can suggest a book or a TV show or some sort of media that we could do as a group together, then I don't see why we couldn't do it. So yeah, open to suggestions. Safira, please help me understand the key to manifestation. I've made a separate video for this, Safira. It's already uh, on the feed, so you can check that out. Lehmund, in Isaac Bonewit's book, that surely can't be his real name, but maybe, uh, Real Magic, he shares his opinion of the lack of difference difference between followers of the left-hand path or right-hand path. He emphasizes both camps are filled with flawed humans doing flawed human shit. Do you have any observations concerning the two paths? It's been a while since I read the book. The main thing I remember from that book is of large, large sections where he goes on about white and black magic. Uh, I, I, I can't really remember the book, so I can't really speak the specifics about uh, flawed humans doing flawed human shit, other than, of course, what else could it be? The left-hand path, right-hand path, we're all humans doing it, so it is going to be flawed humans doing flawed human shit. The left-hand, right-hand path, to a large extent, of how we have it now, how we think of it now is made up and all magic is made up so everything is made up but it comes out of theosophy in many ways although some people can say it does go back to a, a kind of a roman look at things um, and how they kind of separate it and nearly all cultures have a, a you know a good guys and a bad guys which is what ostensibly the left hand path right hand path has kind of been turned into you know because we we, we seem to approach it from uh, depending on what way you, you look at it or which side you're on from you know where the good guys there the bad guys but it seems to come out of uh, theosophy a way of talking about Vamakara, which is left-hand path in Tantra, and how then it was kind of got westernized. And um, Madame Blavatsky herself kind of uses it to, not kind of, totally uses it to disparage people who don't agree with her. You know, they're the black brothers, they're the bad guys, they're the, you know, it's the black lodge, we're the white lodge, we're the good guys. <laughs> And I think, okay, but it it's definitely keeps us in a, an us versus them mode and a duality. Um, I do think there's something that's worthwhile in the left hand, uh, right hand path dichotomy because I do think there is a difference. And I think where we have it right now is kind of the right hand path seems a bit more, you know, almost Christian, good, white magic, airy fairy. <laughs> Nice, orthodox, you know, safe, following tradition, all of that. The left hand path seems mostly as, you know, people who are into Satanism, Luciferianism, Lilith, the Cliff Art, you know, dark stuff, probably listen to heavy metal. Uh, but that's that's the stereotype of it. And if you do like a search for left hand path stuff on uh, Amazon, it's all Satanist stuff. And for me, I don't know, that kind of right hand path, left hand path stuff where it's Christian versus Christian ideal, you know, it, it's, it seems that, that it's not really given a proper representation of what left hand path versus right hand path should be. So I suppose I should say what I think left hand path versus right hand path. Right hand path is following tradition with the goal of returning to the divine um, and returning home, finding your true inheritance. You know, it's the prodigal son returning to the farm, to his father, to where he should have been, having left, made a mistake, left, spent all the money, life fell apart, and comes home. And that's the end goal, the satisfaction of returning to God after the fall, after your mistake, after whatever it is that happened in particular that made you separate from God. Whereas the left-hand path is more about becoming your own God, in a sense. Become a living God. But it's, it's, it has all of the same characteristics to a large extent where it'll still have all the kind of mystical stuff or whatever. But the last stage where you, you know, unite with the divine isn't the last stage in left-hand path. The next one is then you become your own divinity, you know, your own thing. So it's about individualism. It's about finding your own path. It's about getting off the beaten track. It's about not conforming. It's not being part of traditional views. It's not, you know, it's not doing the, your duty. It's not doing what the world tells you. It's beating your own path. There's a very good video. It's very short. It's on YouTube. It's Joseph Campbell. And I think that the title is something like Joseph Campbell Carl Jung left hand path. I don't know why Carl Jung is thrown in there other than um, maybe to get a few more clicks. But he talks about the idea of the right hand path is to traditional life and he has it drawn as a circle this way. <laughs> And that, you know, you go to school, you learn your manners, you learn how to deal with society, you get a job, you become a functional human, you go to, you pray the right prayers, you go to church, you do the right things, you become an upright standing citizen, you know, you do, that's who you are and that's what you do. At the end of it, the day, you go to heaven because you were a good person or, you know, you, you conform. So that's the right hand path to him. 
The left hand path to him is the person who goes off that and goes, hold on, I think there's more to this. There's more to it. And that's what he says. As soon as you come off the path and you go into, you know, you go into difficulty, you get into unknown territory, into different terrain, you essentially start the hero's journey. And that, that can only, the hero's journey can only start once you have taken yourself off the right hand path and go into the left hand path. So that's how he describes it. And I think all kind of magic is left hand path. You've decided to not buy into whatever you've been handed and you've looked for something else. So you've in the Joseph Campbell thing, you've gone off the path, gone off the circle, got off the wheel and started your own hero's journey. I have a lot of left hand path stuff that I really like. I don't really like the satanic Luciferian stuff, although, I, you know, depending on my mood, I can get into it, uh, particularly I have a fondness for Anton LaVey. Most of my studies, say, in Theosophy and the Arcane School, is definitely right hand path and would be selflessness, group work, all of that, but it still has a whole element of left hand patterns, which is essentially you're becoming something rather than you're just returning back to the, you know, to the source, to the divine. It, there's a growth, there's an evolution. So all of these things are kind of mixed up. And I think that if you try to delineate everything, that you're going to find that it, it, it falls apart. In the same way that the recent video that was put up on YouTube about how Ben Shapiro was talking about Satanism and had to ferry edit himself in many ways about how he described it because it would sound uh, like he was agreeing that an awful lot of his opinions agree with what Satanism was saying. That's a good video. I'll put that in the show description. The next question is also related, so we'll go into that. Three small. Been reading some stuff on Tantra, not uh, the sex only stuff. The transgressive part of ritual got me thinking. What are your thoughts on transgressive rituals with reprogramming purposes? So again, to, just talking about the left hand path, the Vamakara, which is originally where I suppose one of the came from, which means left hand path. And we have things like, you know, a right hand man, sinister is left hand. My dad was uh, was beaten out of him. He wasn't allowed right with his left hand at school. He had to write with his right hand because I've seen it as bad. And so you have this kind of transgressive or this kind of uh, element of a scene as it's... Um, the bad side. And that's what's happening in Tantra. Tantra kind of doesn't say, it doesn't have to say that it's uh, everything, you know, that you have to separate the good from the bad. There's a good way to achieve moksha, there's a bad way to achieve liberation. Or there's things that allow you to get liberated and things that don't. To say you can be liberated through anything. And it's the idea that even through the, the crud, the bad, the taboo, the unspeakable, the horribleness, that's still an expression of the divine. And so it's still a path towards the divine and you can still find it in there with the kind of idea that you don't just pick and choose. One day I'm going to have, <laughs> have the ice cream, tomorrow I'm going to drink out of a skull because I'm feeling a bit edgy. It's that you stick with that path until you find the answer. You have to go the whole way through it. It's not just you kind of have to indulge because if you're jumping from thing to thing, what you're really doing is indulging in different stuff. So you're not ever really following the path. An awful lot of our spiritual ideals or our outlooks or you know what what we consider about ourselves are in fact nearly habits and also to become quite taboo for ourselves to even break them an example for me is that i haven't eaten meat in what is it now 30 years something like that and that has become almost like a taboo where i can't do that even if i wanted to because it's it's been so long it's been such a thing that um, it would feel totally and utterly incongruent with my personality to do it. So they would suggest, and you know, the transgress transgressive stuff would say, no, that you should do it because you should break yourself out of that habit. That these kind of initial things that were once disciplines have now become um, prisons. The story I always tell around this is um, of the uh, author uh, Wayne Dyer. There's a bit of darkness in Wayne Dyer, that, uh, uh, but this is a good example. So he talks about that he ran 10 miles every day. Every single day, even if he was in a hotel, he would run through the corridors until his 10 miles were up. And this was his discipline. Until one day his wife said to him, have you ever tried not running for one day? And he said, I could, I, you know, there's no problem. I could not run. It's not, it doesn't control me. It doesn't have anything, you know, I'm in control of it. And he says, at uh, 11.55 that night, he found himself, he was out running around the corridors trying to do his 10 miles because it had become a taboo for him not to break it. So in that kind of sense, breaking your discipline like that has a very good effect because what is actually happening, it's, has not be, it's gone from being a discipline into a habit and into a kind of an imprisonment. If you are strict, don't eat sugar, and now that's become a taboo for you, break the taboo by having some sugar or something like that. Or if you're going from the more tantric approach and the more overall life approach, then it would be a case of following through on it on the darkness, follows the darkness, whatever it is you want to do, the transgressive stuff, you know, the, the outside the norm stuff, but don't do it willy nilly, don't just jump in and jump out and dip your toe in, it's you either do it or you don't, and you follow through until the end, and that's the idea with that. It's very interesting stuff, and uh, I like the Tantra stuff an awful lot. I tell you, the heat in here today, it doesn't help that there's a light just there, blasting at me. 
So we are running a bit late in time. I'm trying to make these videos less than 20 minutes because I, who has time to be watching or listening to anything more? So this is the last question and then we'll split up into another podcast video and do the second half of the question and answer. Coming soon. Abraxas, you have to choose five music albums to listen to for the rest of your life. Which records are you choosing and why? Well, I don't like this question because <laughs> it's kind of pretending that the question is, what is your five favorite albums? But it's not, because if you only have five albums that you can listen to for the rest of your life, you are going to hate this music. So you're going to pick five albums that you're going to ruin for yourself. So you're better off not picking the albums that you like in the hope that in your next life you get to hear the music again that you do love. I really don't know the answer to that. Imagine only being able to hear five albums for the rest of your life. So I'm going to answer the question as if it's what's your top five favourite albums. Abbey Road by the Beatles, particularly the second side. I think it's one of the greatest things that's ever been recorded ever. Ritual the Low Habitual by James Addiction. Again, the second side of it is amazing. It's just uh, absolutely fantastic. First side is brilliant too. Act On Baby by U2, one of my favourite albums of all time. Probably uh, as much to do with nostalgia as anything else. Else, but I just really love the whole metamorphosis between what they were at Rattling Home into what they became at Octon Baby and I really like the whole aesthetics. I like the music. It it's, reminds me of a very great time in my life. Um, just before it all went to shit, strangely enough. Yeah, and I, I'm kind of making excuses because I know YouTube, liking U2 is not cool, but it's still it's one of the key albums in my life. The Frames, I think they're called The Frames DC in America, uh, Dance the Devil. Again, uh, hit me at the right time. It's still an album I listen to uh, an awful lot. Just really enjoy the frames, really enjoy that album. It reminds me of some good times. I think it's some great song right now, it's great melodies, just fantastic. And number five would be the Robin of Sherwood album by Clannad, the soundtrack. It's an album that I've listened to in my entire life through all the different stages from when it came out. I would have been about eight when that uh, TV show came out and that music to now when I'm 45 or whatever age I am. It's very dated and it, it, it probably doesn't hold up as well, but it's just one of those things when I hear it, it just kind of transports me. So that's the five albums I can think of at the minute. If you ask me tomorrow, it could be five different albums. Possibly Abbey Road would always be there. But you know, there'd, there'd, there'd be some other bands that definitely need, would get a mention. It would be very hard. It would be awful. That's an awful curse to send on me, Abraxas, to only allow me five albums for the rest of my life. I don't like it. Thank you for nothing. So, good people of the internet, until the follow-up video to this, which should be out in a few days. If you want to support what I'm doing, uh, there's all the links in the show description so that you can join up to the Patreon. You can buy me a book off my wish list. You can join the Discord and hang out and say hello, like, share, blah, 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 you know all that. Send me some money on PayPal. Buy a book, buy my comic, buy my graphic novels. And uh, all of those things really do help to support and keep this going. I'm very aware that money is tight for everyone. The cost of bread alone is ungodly. <laughs> But uh, if you can spare, please do spare because it keeps me going. But don't feel you have to because I would be doing this for nothing anyway. So until next time, may your best days be ahead and be well.